Tokyo Live Endoscopy One. So hello everyone, uh, welcome to uh, Tokyo Live Endoscopy One. Uh, so I'm Haru Inoue, as the organizer of this session, uh, this uh, program. And uh, uh, today uh, it's my uh, great honor to uh, introduce the uh, uh, moderator of this uh, session. Uh, session title is uh, Current and the Future of AI in Endoscopy. So uh, please welcome uh, Dr. Pratik uh, Sharma. Uh, he is, uh, so everybody knows. So he is a, a great professor of the uh, University of Kansas and uh, he's a world leader. Uh, so of course, a direct and uh, of course in the field of AI. So uh, Pratik, so please open this session. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Haru, and again, uh... Congratulations to you for a marathon work on uh, Tokyo Live. Uh, next year, we will all three be together, hopefully for Tokyo Live. So that would be uh, wonderful. But uh, to all the audience, welcome to the session on uh, AI and endoscopy. And uh, this is a wonderful session with uh, two excellent speakers. And uh, we'll be discussing the role of artificial intelligence in both upper GI and lower GI endoscopy. And of course, uh, AI, this is the current and the future of endoscopy. I truly believe it will change how we practice endoscopy. So with that, we will turn for the first speaker and the first lecture, which is on artificial intelligence and uh, colon polyps. And uh, there is no better person to provide this lecture than uh, Professor Yutaka Saito. And uh, I have now known Yutaka for more than 10 years, I think. And uh, uh, he uh, truly is one of the world's leaders in endoscopy. I've seen him perform in live cases, uh, give lectures. And more recently, I'm working with uh, Yutaka on uh, next year's uh, Endo 2022 program. And it's always my pleasure and honor to work with him. Uh, Yutaka is the chief of endoscopy as well as the director of uh, uh, endoscopy at the National Cancer Center in uh, Tokyo, Japan. So Yutaka, uh, a warm welcome uh, for you uh, to Tokyo Live and to this session on the current and the future of AI in endoscopy, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Pratik, for your kindest introduction. It is uh, my great honor and pleasure to be here again. And thank you, Professor Inoue, uh, for your kind invitation to Tokyo Live. So uh, let's share my slide. Okay, let's start my presentation. No COI for this uh, specific presentation. And as you know, the new technology, including NBI, are defined as optical image enhanced endoscopy, IEE. IEE have developed at NCCH in collaboration with Olympus Medical Systems. First, tumor detection is the first step and the most important for colonoscopy. A first pre-release of the wide vision was done on 10th July 2017 in Japan between NCCH and NEC. Real time detection for five millimeter sessile adenoma is a precise circle and the sound to inform endoscopist. After the pre-release, huge number of endoscopy images were learned more, especially for flat LST energy regions referred to our NCCH for ESP and EMR from nearby endoscopy clinic and hospitals. In the performance evaluation test of this software, we verified whether the software can correctly detect correctal precancerous lesions and whether there are no false positives. 
Under the guidance of our research support center, strict criteria for correct incorrect answers. Correct answers are those that include location information for at least five consecutive frames with, within one section of video. As a result, sensitivity was 98% for the 93 polypoid type regions and 78% for the 257 superficial type. As for the difficult superficial type, however, the sensitivity was the same even for small regions. The use of this AI system by inexperienced physicians resulting in 6% higher detection of superficial regions. Now, WISE Vision is commercially available in Japan and European countries with the certification of CMARC and the PMDA. However, it took three years and a half a month from the pre-release in June to get regulatory approval from PMDA. Uh, this is actual clinical practice using wise vision at NCCH. Endoscope AI from three companies approved by the pharmaceutical affairs in Japan commercialized. However, you need to recognize one thing here. The evaluation criteria for the performance evaluation test differed among three companies. At this time, it will be necessary to standardize them in the future. Three millimeter to C region could be pointed out correctly using wise vision. And LST NG non granular type is really difficult to detect, even for this kind of large region more than two centimeter in diameter. But wise vision also could detect this very flat region correctly, precisely. Another LST non granular type. Oh. This is another LST non granular type. This is also very flat regions, referred to our NCCH for ESD procedure. I'd like to show the result of our Japan polyp study. The present study demonstrated the equivalent accuracy of detecting a neoplasia with a single surveillance colonoscopy at three years compared with two surveillance colonoscopy at one and three years. Uh, neoplasia composed of non polypoid colorectal uh, neoplasia, especially lateral spreading tumor non-granular type were detected at follow-up colonoscopy in this Japan polyp study. One of the advanced neoplasia detected after allocation, LSTNG accounted for 52% of the total and 70% on the light side. Therefore, we could understand it's really essential to detect LSTNG correctly. Could you see any region here? This is pure to C region. After a new carmine diaspring, the margin became clear. It is so called the phantom carcinoma. And surprisingly, using a wide vision, it correctly and precisely detect this to C region. Pit pattern type 3S and then cytoscopy visual the EC type 3A, suggesting interim causal carcinoma, the embryo resection conducted, and the pathology revealed well differentiated tubular adenocarcinoma, interim causal. Uh, purity resection was achieved. Another region, this is UCAM. 
you see associated neoplasia. In the white light, it was impossible to detect this region. Only NBI delineated this very flat 2B region. Even after angel carmine, it's really difficult to trace the margin. And pit pattern show type 3S3L, 5Y low irregular. You can is one of the most challenging one to detect even by an expert endoscopist. But surprisingly, again, this wise vision could detect and delineate this you can correctly. Amazing. Another flat region. LSTNG flat type. And new endoscopy TX system enhanced the redness of this tumor. NBI, pit pattern, crystal bite staining demonstrating type 3S, 3L pit pattern, and the cytoscopic images as well. Yes, wise vision. No problem for this kind of flat region. Correctly and effectively detect. After polyp detection, the next step is characterization. Our NCCH and NEC is also going to develop a new system to diagnose polyp histology. A total number of the training validation and test images, including still images and videos, are listed here. We provided the results of the verification using still images in the table. In terms of sensitivity, we achieved a high sensitivity of 75% to 80% for all classes. In terms of specificity, we achieved a specificity close to 100% for all cases. The inference time per image was 16 milliseconds. Next, the sensitivity for each observation method. The sensitivity increased step by step from white light to image enhanced endoscopy and chromoscopy as shown. The data is consistent with our daily clinical practice. Uh, verification using uh, videos. The result of the uh, inference for each frame are shown in the table. You can see that the sensitivity and specificity about 10% lower than the cases using still images. We will show you a demonstration video using the uh, qualitative diagnostic model we created. First, what typical serrated regions? You can see that it was properly diagnosed as serrated regions. Secondly, a typical adenoma that is also properly diagnosed. And typical adenocarcinoma, 1P regions. That is also answered correctly. Future AI plan will be a multimodality AI to predict cancer metastasis and patient prognosis. There will be lots of hurdles to achieve this project, but this is our dream. Now, Japanese young endoscopist learn IEE diagnosis from this textbook supervised Professor Tajiri and Professor Inoue. Is this learning no longer necessary? The answer is no. It is still necessary. All responsibility for final diagnosis still fall on us, endoscopist. So we need to keep learning IEE even after AI technology development. Thank you very much for your kind attention.
you, uh, Yutaka, for that uh, wonderful lecture, and as well as uh, sharing with us your personal vision for this uh, field, which I think is extremely important. And also, congratulations on trying to build this thing together, because I think that is the key, is that we need very good collaboration between physicians and industry to make sure that it is happening the right way. So um, I have a few questions for you, uh, and okay. I think that will hopefully inform people also about it. So one of the important things you mentioned was the differences in the different systems as mm -hmm. to how the model is trained and yeah. how the model is tested. So what is your opinion? I mean, you nicely did show the differences, but um, moving forward for this transparency and uh, showing uh, how good these models are, what, what is your recommendation uh, that as new devices come out, how transparent should they be? And how should they be able to tell us so that we can trust the black box which is being built? Oh, thank you very much. It's a really uh, important question. Uh, probably, I think, so uh, we need uh, some uh, benchmark uh, test model for the newly developed AI, because even in the Japanese three commercially available AI products, the uh, evaluation criteria for the performance uh, evaluation test differed among these three uh, companies. That this is, might be because the this is the first experience even for the Japanese PMDA to approve the endoscopy AI. But uh, maybe I believe in the near future, the PMDA also have the same uh, criteria for uh, accepting the new AI systems. And uh, probably, uh, Professor in a way, the president of JGS. JGS should uh, uh, show the some uh, benchmark criteria for the newly developed AI from now. Okay, thank you. Um, the and as I was looking at some of those videos, which were very good. I mean, my question, Kay, uh, I was thinking, is that does somebody like Yutaka? need AI in practice, or is he already so good that he can recognize all those lesions anyway? So the broader question to you is that, is this helpful for experts or less experienced people or for the fellows or trainees, or do you think this is going to be helpful for everyone? Oh, thank you very much. It's also very important. Uh, points. Uh, I believe this AI is uh, helpful for every endoscopist, including the experts. However, the expert can uh, di uh, detect and diagnose the, even for the difficult lesion in their practice. However, the human being uh, have some uh, for attention will decrease yes. due to the, uh, ex, uh, the tire, tiredness. Yeah, they will get so, fat fatigued over time. Yes. yes. And when we detect one region, so our attention only focus on the um, detected region and we will miss the region uh, is uh, behind the folds or uh, in the uh, peripheral area of the endoscopy monitors. However, AI could detect these region very correctly. Uh, that is why AI will help not only uh, trainees, but also for the experts. So Pratik, uh, may I ask a, a question to your- Please, yes. Uh, yes, so uh, Saito-sensei, it's a, a really amazing presentation. I'm so surprised because uh, you showed us a lot of case of a flat and depressed lesion uh, detected by the uh, 
wise vision of uh, NEC. It's a, it's a very, very impressive. So, so I think this is, uh, uh, of course, a kind of software. And then, so maybe uh, National Cancer Center, so uh, you um, uh, include a lot of data of the TC or that <coughs> region. So if, if we apply this uh, software in a Europe and the United States, so in a US, uh, we can detect more TC or flat region. So, so is it uh, uh, may happen or not? It's a question for Pratik, Pratik Sharma. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, it's a really uh, good point. So we also uh, expect that such kind of the NEC wise vision will increase the polyp detection rate, especially for the flat region, LST energy and 2C region outside Japan. So 20 years ago, the 2C region was only detected by Professor Kudo and it's so-called the local disease or Akita disease or phantom carcinoma. But the, the truth is the 2C really exists, but we couldn't find it. But uh, this AI uh, can detect the maybe AI have the eye of the Professor Kudo. So that is my uh, opinion. So Pratik, would you uh, give us some comment? Yeah, sure. So um, I think this goes a little bit more to the issue of uh, how the AI systems are built and how and what they can detect. So one of the challenges, not just for Utaka and for the cancer center or for NEC, it's not a problem for that system, but it's a problem for all systems is a general limitation, which is called generalizability, okay? So the system works only in the population that you have studied it in. It cannot be made generalizable to other systems. And I think that is one of the, I wouldn't say drawback for AI, but it is one of the challenges for AI is that we will have to train the model for the population you want to test it in. So for example, if this is developed on the Japanese patients, unfortunately, I don't think it will work very well for American patients you will have to train the model by using videos and images and the data from American patients, you know? And the same thing uh, the other way around also is that if there is a product or an AI which is made in the US and we want to launch it in Japan, yes, maybe it can get approval and everything, but the system will have to be trained for Japanese patients, you know? Because the bowel prep, the lining of the mucosa, the size of the polyps, the types of the polyps, everything is different in different populations. So that is, I think, unlike NBI, BLI, cytoscopy, which is operator dependent, you know, so you can see this is a machine. So unfortunately, I think this is going to be one of the challenges for not just Vice Vision, but for all AI systems in the future is this whole issue number one what yutaka said is the transparency and the explainability of the model which is not existent right now but the second thing is this whole issue about generalizability of the model yeah thank you very much i i yes i i, I totally agree with you so now the uh, so each companies um uh, AI is uh, started in a, uh, some uh, uh, local uh, data. And then so in the future, maybe uh, big data. So that covers the global. Then so uh, we can cover very widely, I think, I hope. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yes. Yeah, thank, oh, thank you very much for critiques that really uh, 
nice uh, comments. The general, generalization, generality is one of the key. But uh, do you think uh, the column, uh, yeah, I think preparation, preparation is a little bit different between countries. So maybe it is one of the limitation of the bowel preparation between countries. But uh, how about the chronic mucosa or polyp? It's different between the uh, Asian people, Indian people, or uh, Caucasian in the US. How do you think about it? I, I think it's almost the same. Chronic uh, mucosa is not so di different between the uh, Asian people and the US peoples. How no, so that's a good point, Yutaka. And I, mm. I was uh, probably not a big believer in uh, this concept as well. But if you read uh, the literature uh, in how these models are trained, I mean, it becomes very clear that a model can become biased if it is not tested in the appropriate population. So for example, the engineers in Boston at MIT, they did the experiment in which they trained the model in such a way that it started calling a dog a cat, you know, because you can fool the model, right? You can, because ultimately you have to put in the criteria of what you think uh, each one of these lesions appears as. So it probably will work, Yutaka. I don't think that uh, it will be a huge problem, but I think for all of us as the experts in this field, it is very important also is that, yes, we should embrace this technology, but we should also be aware of what the problems may be so mm. that you don't start overcalling lesions. Uh, because the other issue is what I was going to ask you also for your system is uh, the false positive rate, right? I mean, so one of the challenges with AI is going to be that is it going, if it has too many false positive, it can increase the duration of the procedure. Because every time you hear a sound, you stop because you think that there is a polyp there, but maybe it is an air bubble. Maybe it is a piece of stool, you know? So I think there are these issues. I'm not saying it's with th this system, but in general. So I think we have to be very careful about also the downstream effects of what this can uh, create. But I think your presentation was extremely balanced. You showed us the true you know, accuracy of the system, which I was very pleased to see because if you do studies with only a hundred images, you can have an accuracy of 100%, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and we know that that is not true. So uh, the way you clearly showed that as the size increases, as the type of technique increases, you go from white light to NBI to endocytoscopy, uh, your sensitivity keeps on increasing, which is very reassuring because, which tells us that the model is not perfect in the sense, which is what you would expect it because nothing you know is 100%. So uh, thank you very much for uh, sharing that also because uh, I, I think that is the best way. So I'm really pleased that uh, Yutaka, you're uh, doing it the right way, which is uh, the physician, meaning you at the cancer center, you are in charge of this, you are designing the study the best way and then you are testing a commercial or creating a system, which I think is uh, the best way to do it. And that's what we are trying to do, at least through the ASGE as well, is through our task forces, trying to develop some of these uh, criteria, which they should be uh, having. Ah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your excellent comments. Oh, and the Pradik Bandari also joining and the key their hospital also are testing our uh, wise vision. So maybe next step that we uh, want to share the wise vision in the USA by Pratik Sharma. Thank you. Sure, happy to do it. So um, Haru, uh, yes. should we move on to uh, uh, Pradeep's uh, lecture or do you have yes. any other comments, please? please? No, 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 it's okay. So please, please. Indeed. Okay. 
Well, uh, good to see uh, Pradeep. He's uh, usually late, so I'm sure that he's <laughs> exactly. following his typical <laughs> pattern. I mean, uh, to uh, do that, but no, I mean, it is my uh, pleasure uh, to introduce a very good friend, uh, Pradeep Bandari, who uh, probably needs no introduction because now he is one of the leaders in this field of uh, artificial intelligence and Pradeep is a consultant gastroenterologist at Queen Alexandra Hospital. And one of his traits is that his ability to adapt to new innovations, you know, so right from uh, ESD in the esophagus to the stomach to the colon, uh, Pradeep has really shown what uh, innovative endoscopist he is and has really led this field in Europe in the field of uh, artificial intelligence. And uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce him. And uh, Pradeep, we are looking forward to your lecture on uh, Barrett's neoplasia and the role of AI, please. Thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, always a pleasure uh, to join Tokyo Live. I think this has become one of the uh, biggest platform for endoscopy in the world. So if anybody needs to know any endoscopist in any country, I think they should log into Tokyo Live and they can find out. So it's a real pleasure to join. Artificial intelligence has been a, a, a new toy and a passion for a lot of us, including myself. Uh, I just uh, wish and believe that AI could come quickly enough, uh, especially to prevent perforation because that's why I'm late my colleague who was trying to do ESD in colon and had a perforation. So I had to really go and sort that out. I hope in the future AI will stop those things happening and I will never <laughs> be late again, I promise you. But let's focus on the task for now. Uh, and uh, I will uh, quickly go through these are my potential conflicts. Uh, I will uh, talk about the role of AI for Barrett and sizing of polyps. And do we really need that? Well, for, for upper GI, there's a plenty of data from the West as well from the East that we miss upper GI cancers. One in 400 or the other way to look at it will be 11% of upper GI cancers are missed because they're diagnosed within three years of the last endoscopy. So we're not perfect. What about Barrett's? This is an interesting way of looking at things. This is where they have looked at referred population coming to expert centers with a diagnosed lesion and experts have found that in this population 76% uh, of them had a second lesion which the referring center did not uh, find or did not detect. Now it's a little bit controversial. We can't always call them as a missed because there is a, a bias, human bias. When we see a big lesion, we tend to ignore the rest of the field in endoscopy so it's probably related to that, but still gives you a message that we do miss lesion in Barrett's. Uh, and why? You can see why, because doing AI for colon is so easy. Uh, there is a big mushroom in the colon and AI has to find, look at this. It's completely normal looking Barrett. The lesion is so, so subtle. We require all kinds of enhanced imaging to find out it's a 2B lesion. Uh, it's very subtle changes. When you use magnification, you can see all these vascular changes. Uh, and then you can make out that this is neoplastic. Uh, on the other hand, you can see this one as well. Uh, again, another patient with uh, Barrett's esophagus, white light endoscopy uh, shows a prominent gastric fold, but nothing else wrong. When we spray acetic acid, you can see uh, that there is a slight 2C depressed area. Then this entire area around and above the fold loses its aceto whitening very quickly. So that's dysplastic as well. So you can see the challenge. This is very challenging for AI as well as for humans. For everyone, this is a very challenging area to detect neoplasia. The current standard remains a high definition white light with protocol guided biopsies. And we know that we miss at least 15 to 20% of neoplasia, even when people follow the protocol. But the biggest problem is people don't follow the protocol. 
because patients become too uncomfortable and doctors don't follow protocol very well. So here comes AI. I'm not going to go through the details of AI and machine learning and deep learning, but it, when it comes to Barrett's, AI can detect whether you have Barrett's or you don't have Barrett's, and it can measure uh, the amount of Barrett's you have. Uh, AI can also find the lesion if you have a neoplastic lesion in the Barrett's, and it can localize the lesion for us where exactly the neoplastic lesion is. AI can also delineate the exact boundaries of these neoplasias. That way it can assist the person who's going to resect it so that the R0 rate can go up. Uh, and finally, AI can characterize and stage the exact nature of neoplasia, whether it's intramucosal, SM1, mole, T2, all those things. So that's all within the realms of AI. And this is a continuum. This will continue to develop till we reach that stage. At the current stage where we are, uh, at the system developed by NEC called Wise Vision can detect and localize the exact location of neoplasia. And further work carries on to reach that stage. So here's the, our, uh, I won't go into the developmental side of it to save some time, uh, but our first validation was performed on images. Uh, and you can see that image base shows very high sensitivity and accuracy. So it looked very impressive on image base, but there are other about three other studies now in the literature, including the papers in gastro and GIE, which are all done on image based uh, uh, validation. Uh, so during this time, we also figured out that uh, the, the speed at which our AI algorithm detects is very high as compared to the human eye, which has a latency of about 55 milliseconds. Uh, and the speed at which it delineates is also much faster than uh, what a human eye does. So this is all set for real time use. So we felt that we don't need to restrict ourselves to image based analysis and validation on images. Uh, so uh, what we done now, uh, rather than showing you uh, how it detects and these heat map localizing it, I want to show you the real time use. This is the wise vision. You can see a nodular lesion in Barrett. As soon as a neoplastic frame is detected, a color code appears, image gets transferred on the top and the heat map at the right bottom shows you the location. You come back to it and you can hear the audible noise. Look at another lesion, it finds you have the color code, image gets transferred the top right and the heat map shows you the exact location. And there is that audible noise for people who want it. Uh, this is a very difficult lesion in retroflexion. You can see uh, slightly raised with central depression only seen in retroflexion, but wise vision finds it. And the heat map gives you the location of the lesion. Uh, so I think you can see from this video that it is ready for real time use. This is a tricky one, whether it's a gastric fold or a lesion on top of gastric fold, but it delineates exactly tells you uh, where the gastric fold stops and where the lesion is. So it distinguishes between the lesion and the gastric fold. So again, it tells you how good it can be in the in reducing and minimizing the false positive rates. So this is unpublished. We just about to submit uh, our highly confidential unpublished data. I'm not sure I was allowed to show this or not, but anyway, I've sh shared it anyway now. Uh, we have uh, validated in external video sets on a video-based validation with 75 videos, uh, 44 or so were neoplastic with 30 being uh, non-neoplastic. You can see uh, AI as compared to endoscopies has a very high accuracy, has a very high sensitivity of 93.8 compared to 63% for endoscopies and a negative predictive value of 95.1%. Now, uh, the two lesions that we missed, they were both low grade dysplasias. So as uh, we know that ASG set up, sorry, 
ASG set up the NPV for high grade dysplasia and adenocarcinoma. So if you take this low grade dysplasia out from this uh, population, then uh, wise vision is already set to meet uh, the ASG's PV for detection and targeted biopsies for Barrett's neoplasia with this technology. Uh, I know that we need to do uh, a real-time study in patients, but this, is, these, this study was done on real-time videos and externally collected videos. Uh, here you can see why. I won't go through this uh, complex uh, table, but look at the difference between flat lesions. So we had about 27 flat lesions. So these are very challenging lesions as I showed you earlier in my videos. And we had five uh, uh, nodular lesions. You see here, when it comes to nodular lesion, AI has 100% sensitivity, but the doctors, the endoscopists also have a very high sensitivity in detecting 2A or nodular lesions. When it comes to flat lesion, that is where the biggest difference is. This is where the unmet need is. This is the niche area. This is where the endoscopy struggle. This is where wise vision is really, really good. You see a sensitivity of 92 as compared to 58% in the hand of these seven endoscopists who were all endoscopists experienced in gastroscopy and in Barrett's, but not really Barrett's experts. So you can see that the data is looking very, very promising and it's ready for real-time use. So in conclusion, I feel that AI is not going to replace endoscopists, but uh, endoscopists using AI will certainly outperform those who are not using AI. And I think it acts as an expert second observer, which improves the performance and outcome for the patients. As far as Barrett's is concerned, I strongly believe that AI will make the procedure very cost effective because we completed EBA recently and we know with acetic acid, we can reduce the number of biopsies by tenfold in surveillance population. With the help of AI, we can reduce the number of biopsies even more. So the procedure will become quicker, less biopsies, so more cost saving. Uh, and certainly decision-making will become easier. Very quickly going through the sizing, we always talk about resect and discard for now 10 years, but has not been introduced because the threshold set at five millimeter, lot of challenges, but one of the challenges, we don't have an accurate sizing system. Similarly, size matters for a lot of other things. I won't go through the details, but size is important in endoscopy. And so far we do not have an accurate sizing system. So here is our first experiment where we created artificial uh, polyps in pig colon. They were very, very accurately and precisely measured polyps created in pig colon. And we found that the endoscopists were all over the place in sizing the polyps. Uh, it was really very, very interesting to see even expert endoscopists were all over the place in their sizing. So we knew that we need to uh, produce uh, some uh, accurate sizing system. And here you can see uh, that when we uh, use our computer vision technology, it produced very good sizing as compared to the endoscopist. So if I go to the next slide, you can see the polyp here. We are doing binary sizing. Category B means more than five millimeter. Category A means less than five millimeter. So this AI-based sizing, at the moment we're doing binary sizing because as I said, resect and discard. Now, as Dr. Saiko showed you, it can detect polyp, it can characterize polyp, so we can get optical diagnosis to very good sensitivity. So what is lacking is this sizing. If we can now accurately say what is five millimeter, what is more than five millimeter, then I think we are set to introduce resect and discard strategy in real practice. And when that is introduced, there'll be massive, massive health economic benefit and potentially less harm to the patient from unnecessary polypectomies that get performed. So in conclusion, uh, Wise Vision is the one and only AI device available in the Western world, which is CE mark for polyp detection 
it is C mark for polyp characterization, and it is C mark for detection of Barrett's neoplasia in real time. So I feel that this is a real, real moment of change where our practice can be changed in a positive way with the help of this technology. And I will stop there uh, and stop sharing my screen so that we can have some discussion. Thank you. Okay, Pradeep, uh, thank you very much uh, for that wonderful presentation. And uh, you know, really the sizing part that you spent some time on towards the end. Uh, we'll start off with that because it lends very well from where Yutaka uh, left off as and uh, things like that. So uh, Pradeep, where do you see this headed in terms of practical application is that somebody's using uh, this AI software, and now the computer is doing everything for them and is helping guide them to do it. So do you see a point where some polyps are now being left behind because they don't meet the criteria for, uh, you know, something that needs to be resected? And what sort of, uh, you know, sort of legal implications would be involved uh, with a machine helping an endoscopist to make all these uh, assessments. What are your thoughts about that, Pradeep? That's a very, very good point and a very practical one uh, because uh, as you know, in England, we have a body called NICE, National Institute of Clinical Excellence. And a few years ago, they reviewed the, all the literature and said there's technology and data both support the introduction of resect and discard strategy for polyps because there's so many studies saying NBI can do, this can do, but nobody's introduced, no one practices that, despite the fact that we've been characterizing and saying we can do that. And the main stumbling block was A, the confidence by which we make that optical diagnosis was lacking. And when it was generalized to outside of expert centers, it failed. Just so much, many studies saying only works in expert centers then, and in study setting, it fails in real setting. And the second thing was we did not have an accurate measure for sizing. Now with AI, the optical diagnosis can be generalized. You don't need to be Professor Saito to make that accurate diagnosis. Even I can make that diagnosis with the help of AI. My fellows can make that with the help of AI. So it's generalizable. And now we have sizing and that gives you a clear cutoff. The data is very clear that polyps less than five millimeter, almost negligible, zero risk, almost zero risk for cancer in them. So the scene is set for leaving hyperplastic polyp and rectosigmoid behind less than five millimeter and resect and discard adenomas all around the colon less than five millimeter. But you raised a very important point in terms of how do we introduce and the legal implications and practice implications, I think it remains the same. In the past, when things went wrong, people would go back to the endoscopy report. They would look at pictures if they were available. And I can tell you in UK, probably about 20% of the reports will have pictures. Others won't have pictures. So your fallback was pathology archives. That's what we used to look at them. So now with AI, it's very easy. The same system can record the procedure, can record and store the images, and we can archive them. So if there is a problem, this can be pulled out. Experts like yourself and Professor Saito and Inoue can review that and say, no, this guy is right. He hasn't missed anything. Uh, and we can defend ourselves. That's what I feel. I'm not sure how everyone else feels. So share your thoughts. So Yutaka, you think uh, this, uh, with the help of real-time detection, sizing, and characterization, do you think that the Japanese endoscopists will not remove a three millimeter polyp in the colon? Uh, yeah, that's a good point. It depends on the, each endoscopist, uh, someone, uh, resect even for small one when diagnosed as adenomatous lesions. But uh, for hyperplastic, so we will leave it. But uh, 
On the others, we leave the small adenomatous region less than five millimeter, but it depends on the surveillance protocol. If the patient can come back uh, three or five years later, we can leave the small adenomatous regions. But if not, maybe it's better to resect all adenomatous uh, polyps, even for the small regions. And recently, the cold snare polypectomy, it's a really nice, no uh, adverse events, no delayed bleeding. Uh, so it's better to dissect all adenomatous lesions if de when detected. But of course, there is some limitation for the patient with multiple adenomas. It's really impossible to dissect all uh, lesions uh, detection. So I think the polyp characterization including the polyp size is really nice for us, even for us endoscopists. And uh, maybe it would be much easier for us if the AI could automatically generate endoscopic reports. Yes. So uh, Pradeep, uh, the follow-up question to that is, so now uh, somebody is doing a colonoscopy with AI and now he starts finding in every patient, you know, multiple diminutive adenomas, two millimeter adenomas. What's, what's the benefit? I mean, are you say, actually helping by really detecting too many of these diminutive adenomas by AI? Is it really making a, a clinical impact on the patient? Very good point. Uh, so the data right now shows exactly what you're talking about that uh, in the current four or five published randomized trials, uh, AI is being seen to increase the ADR, but primarily by increasing the detection of polyadenomas less than five millimeter in size. Uh, so you can uh, raise that question that you quite appropriately raised. But my view is these adenomas which are missed, uh, these small adenomas are missed mostly by endoscopists uh, how do I put it, who are not the most expert endoscopists. They are average endoscopists, the ADR is low, and we know that if we can improve the performance of these endoscopists and if the ADR goes up, data is very clear that with every 1% uh, increase in ADR, 3% reduction in uh, interval cancer rates. So there is a surrogate benefit of this is the overall quality will improve overall miss rate will drop down. Yes, it's not been proven right now, but that's imminent. That is implied to me. Okay, good. And then uh, Pradeep, one question about uh, the nice videos you showed on the uh, Barrett. So uh, the delineation part, do you think it's helping you get a better R0 resection now, or you think it's there in the future? Do you think it's here or it's coming? I mean, because your videos were very impressive and the heat maps, I really enjoyed those. So can you please share that information? That's a very good idea. So when we started the journey of developing AI for Barrett about two years ago, uh, we went through various thought processes. When you start these things, you never know where to start, what to do, and you want to do everything, then the reality sinks in and you realize you can't do everything. So our vision was first to say whether we design it to detect Barrett. And very quickly, I realized that in the Western world, you don't need doctors, you don't need help to detect Barrett. So we ditched that idea. Then we went with the idea, which is where Wise Vision right now is, that if you have a neoplasia in a Barrett segment, then we need help to identify where that neoplasia is so the doctors can evaluate that area carefully and take a targeted biopsy. So Wise Vision right now, how it stands is a system which uh, gives a bird's eye view, identifies high risk zone in your barracks and tells you there is a problem here. And the doctor then looks at that area and takes a targeted biopsy. So it's not designed for delineating exactly the margins, not designed to help with EMR or ESD. It's designed for surveillance where you can take a targeted biopsy rather than the protocol guided biopsy. This is the vision. 
hasn't been proven as compared to the conventional protocol, but that is happening. No, that's, that, that's very appropriate because I think that's where the community gastroenterologists need the most help. So uh, thank you for that. Haru, I'm going to turn it over to you. I see you've been busy taking some notes. So if you have any questions, please. Uh, mute it, you, uh, Professor Inoue. Oh, yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Um, Pradeep, thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I really appreciate the uh, uh, great two speaks, uh, speakers. And the, uh, first, uh, I would like to say uh, congratulations on getting the CE mark and the, uh, the, the particular in the colon and the direct esophagus. <clears throat> and the, um, I'm so impressed that the, um, of course, um, uh, we have still, we have now, we have the uh, uh, black box and then uh, diagnostic black box and the uh, uh, transparency uh, uh, pratique emphasize that that is uh, important in the future. Uh, and the, on the other hand, so Pradeep, uh, uh, you mentioned that the, if there is a, a misdiagnosis by AI, so we can get uh, uh, collected so on the, uh, the exact data, and then um, uh, so we can make a, a collection and ad adjustment uh, to the better and better. And the uh, you know, second generation, third generation, it, uh, yeah. of course, the uh, diagnosis is uh, accuracy increases. So uh, anyway, so uh, thank you very much uh, to speakers and uh, our great moderator. <laughs> so uh, uh, I really appreciate it. So thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. And I I'm, I'm, uh, hope that we can get them um, uh, things uh, getting better and better and they uh, provide the uh, patient uh, yes so high quality uh, screening and the detection of the cancer early, early detection of the disease yeah thank you okay thank you, thank you all. yeah thank, thank you very much